he's pulling no punches on this trip. He knows this is the last time he's going to see the Sea of Galilee from his own physical eyes. He knows this is the last time he's going to walk the sand where he felt fed the 5,000 or the grass, the green grass to be specific. He knows this is the last time he's going to Jerusalem. Somebody comes up and says, what do I need to do to enter the kingdom? He knows he's going to the Passover. He knows he's going to the cross. And he says, if you want to follow me, do as I do. If you have a Bible, this is Palm Sunday, by the way. I mentioned that earlier. And so Palm Sunday is, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's, it's a celebration. In, uh, and really, kinda, it kind of started as a tradition. Um, they call it Palm Sunday because it was the day that Jesus was welcomed in Jerusalem. But you're going to see this morning, it was not a triumphant entry. It was not a happy day. There was a whole lot of pain going on. And you're going to hear a message today that um, I know is going to move you. Turn to Mark chapter 11, verse 1 through 11. I want to read the word of God with you, and then we'll get into the, the message. Mark chapter 11, starting in verse 1. As they approached Jerusalem, okay, so, but just a little context before we get going. That, that means as they, as they left Galilee is what that means. They literally left Galilee, which is um, an 80-mile journey from Galilee to all the way down to Jerusalem. But people say up to Jerusalem because it's a high place in Israel. So they're going uphill, but south, all right? So it's kind of confusing, but they're heading south. And this is the last time Jesus is in Galilee. It's the last time he's in Samaria. It's the last time he's in Jericho. It's the last time he crosses the Jordan River. It's the last time he comes into Jerusalem. That's the journey. Okay, so as they approached Jerusalem, they came to Bethpage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, just as you enter it, you'll find a colt tied there, which no one has ever written, ridden. Untie it and bring it here. Not a horse, it's a donkey, okay? Um, untie it, bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it, okay? And we'll send it back shortly, okay? I've heard pastors abuse this whole story. And I've heard pastors actually take the Bible and preach a whole, like a whole message on the donkey. Come on, somebody. Like, what was the donkey feeling carrying Jesus? You know, that is not the point of the story. I'm going to tell you the point of the whole story today. <sighs> they went and found the colt outside the street, tied in a doorway. And as they t untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus, they threw their cloaks over it, and they sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches. And John chapter 12 tells us they're palm branches. That's the only place that calls them palm branches, and that's why it's called Palm Sunday, okay? Others spread branches they cut on the fields, and those who went ahead and those who followed which means there's a massive, you're going to see how big the crowd is today. It's a massive crowd in front of Jesus and behind Jesus. He's right in the middle, riding a donkey colt. I mean, his feet were probably like dragging the ground. I mean, I know you would have showed up if you're being declared a king. You would have shown up in an old Lamborghini or something. But his, his drips a, roll, a robe and his ride is a donkey. They shouted, save us now. It says Hosanna, but that word, Yahashua is the name for Jesus, Yeshua. And Yasha is save, save us, Yasha. Na, 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 in A is now, save us now. It's Hosanna. I know some of y'all thought it means praise. It doesn't. It means save us now. Save us now. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Save us now in the highest heaven. And what an anticlimactic ending. You got to get this. Jesus entered Jerusalem, went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the 12. How many of y'all have ever heard of CrossFit? Know any crazy people who do CrossFit? Ever heard of CrossFit? Ever done CrossFit? CrossFit's like a, a, it's a, it's a workout program for amazingly crazy people. And um, they put what's called workout of the days 
on the board. And when you go to a CrossFit gym, you'll see what's called the WOD, W-O-D. And it stands for, everybody say it with me, workout of the day. Come on, say it again. Workout of the day. And man, what they do is some of the most incredible workouts of the day. I'm going to show you the most intense one in just a second. But the most incredible workouts of the day are like known in the entire CrossFit world as impossible. And this morning, I'm going to give you an impossible workout, okay, that you can't modify. It's an incredible workout, and it's called this WOD, the, filth, the Filthy Three. The Filthy Three. Write down, that's the title of today's sermon. You're like, what is that? That's the title of the message, The Filthy Three. Write it down. Father, today in Jesus' name, we come into your presence. Like my friends, they got dressed. I know they came here to hear from you, not a man. I know you speak through your word. I know you speak through preaching. And many, many messages are going to be heard in their ears. But I ask you, Lord, to lead them home today. That you lead them to you today. That you have mercy on every person in this room. We all came to hear from you, not a man. So speak in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Come on, high five your neighbor and tell him. You look like you've been working out a little bit. Tell him. Look like you've been working out a little bit. I uh, had a friend of mine here in the first service who's from Monroe, Louisiana, West Monroe, Louisiana, named Holly Shaw was her name. I knew her growing up, and, and um, her, her had a little brother named Sherman Shelby Shooter Shaw II. I remember that name because that's like a little tongue tire. And Abby was her sister who graduated with me, and Holly was the same age, but um, I held back for sport reasons. And anyway, so she graduated ahead, but she was actually married to a guy named Mike Gray. And they were here in the first service from Monroe, Louisiana. And Mike and I played for the same, like, militant, crazy high school football coach. How many of y'all had at least one militant, crazy high school football coach who got all of his aggression out and feels like the, the best way to turn you into a player is to actually play you until you can't breathe, can't see, can't feel anything, and you're just so intense, you won't come out of the game, and they're like, they literally push you beyond limits. I literally, I'm not pulling my pant legs up, but I've got scars on my shin for doing what you're about to see on the screen today, jumping up on boxes. I would be jumping up on like, I would, I'm, I'm 6'3 now because I've shrunk a little bit, but I used to be 6'4. In college, I was about 6'4", six, uh, six 320 pounds, played center for LSU back in the day, way before they got good. But that was, that's funny. <laughs> But we, we, did, we did a lot of Olympic-type workouts, and, like, and the reason I bring up Mike and Holly is because you could ask Mike, because it was even crazier before, because he's been young a lot longer than I've been young. <laughs> he's older than me. I, I, people, some people are like, they're like, I'm old. I'm like, no, you've been young a long time. I know how to compliment people. You've been young. Y'all are laughing today. Y'all are a tough crowd. And so, like, if you go and look at the CrossFit world, what they do is they, they put you into what they call, like, real-life motions and real body motions and things that you're actually going to need because you're, you're never going to be, like, laying down, pushing a bitch like that. So they actually put you in full-body motions to give you a whole-body workout, and they've ranked these workouts based on the most difficult workout they have. And the most incredible workout they have is this is the hardest workout of all time. It's called the Filthy 50 Everybody say filthy 50. And the filthy 50 in the CrossFit world, like if you just read this, you know, they, they're, you're like, I could never do that. They say, just come to the gym. And you're like, I'm, I'm not doing CrossFit. People get injured all the time. No, no, no. You can modify your workout and do what's ever best for you. You're like, modify? I'd like to try it. But if you're anything like me, come on, I, I, I can't go and do the gym and modify because if I see somebody working hard, my high school football coach is in my head, and he's like, you know, if you want to, if you want to work out like a three-year-old, modify. <laughs> if you want to be a real man, come on, muscle up. And I'm like, I know I'm hurt, I can't move my arm, but I'm gonna do this anyway. And like, I get injured every time I get in a workout mode. Every time, my wife's like, be careful, man. Just like go swimming, just walk in the pool. You're old. I'm like, amen. You know, but tell them the other part of my brain. Filthy fifty. It's known as the Filthy 50 because there's, put it up here so I can see, yeah, so it's 24 box jumps, okay? So you jump up on a 24-inch box. That's just a two-foot box. You're like, well, I can do that. 50 times, one. That's good. Modify. Just put one foot up on top of it. <laughs> modify. What you doing? Box jumps? You said modify. Who's your daddy? <laughs> and then you got the 50 jumping pull-ups. And I, I'd just be like, I'd jump up and grab the bar, swing a little bit. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Modify. What are you doing? I'm practicing jumping. I want the low bar. Like, 
pull up. I did. You missed it. It was too fast. And then the next one is 50 kettlebell swings. Like, kettlebell swings. Then you got 50 walking lunge steps. I mean, I ain't going to the ground. I hurt my knees. I just do this. I'm modified. How many of y'all like you'd like to come to my gym? You're going to come in fat, you're going to leave fat. Come on, somebody. <laughs> knees to elbows. I ain't doing that. I'd be touching my knees, man. That's me right there. Modify. Everybody say modify. Modify. 45-pound push press. I, I do just air press. 50. I got this all day. They said modify. Modify. You can't modify the cross, my friend. 50 back extensions. I got that one. 20 pound wall balls. 50. I'm just going to lean up against the wall. Modify. 50 burpees. I know I can burp 50 times. Come on, somebody. <laughs> I know it. You give me some root beer to Dr. Pepper. I got your burpees. Burpees like drop to the ground, stand back up. I dropped to the ground after all this. I am not getting back up. 50 double unders. This morning, I want to share with you the filthy, the filthy three. Not the filthy, fi filthy 50, the filthy three. And the first part of the filthy three is what's called the 80-mile context. The 80-mile context. Context is everything. If you're in the land purchasing business or the real estate business, They'll tell you 100% of the time, if you buy a business or you start a business, what are the three most important things in real estate? Location, location, location. Come on, say it with me. Location is number one, number two, and number three. In reading your Bible, it's context, context, context. That's why I joked about pastors ripping scripture out of context and just preaching a whole sermon on the donkey. Like, like preach the word. Like, Palm Sunday is a significant deal, but it's not because of the donkey. That's a little bitty part of it, but it's way more than the donkey. It's about everybody singing holes in. It's way more than that. You've got you to gotta go. It's like some, some people get like, whenever I teach, sometimes I read a verse, and I'm like, i got to give the whole context. Why? Because context, context, context matters. So if you want an 80-mile context, you have to understand that there, I'm going to show you how big the crowd is in a second, but you've got to understand that there is a massive crowd of human beings who know Jesus is a prophet but have no idea he's going to a cross even though he's already told them twice. Even though he's already told them that he's got to be crucified, buried, and raised in three days. They miss that. They're like, metaphor, modify, find another way. And even he in the Garden of Gethsemane is like, Father, if there's any other way, if there's any way to modify, this workout. Yet not my will, your will be done. The 80 mile context starts off in all of the gospels. And so if you ever just say the word synoptic, synoptic means similar. Everybody say similar. That's a big word for somebody from Louisiana. So uh, sim similar, or is it similar? Or is it similar? It's just similar. It's just, just, just say the same. It's the same. The same. Synoptic Gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Mark is by far the shortest. Almost everybody believes it was the very first one written. Matthew is written to a Jewish context, a Jewish audience, and so there's elements to the story that he includes that are, would be understood by a Jewish audience. Luke is written almost exclusively to a Gentile, a non-Jewish audience, so there's a lot of, like he starts his journey to Jerusalem in, in Luke chapter 9, and it's like, it's not chronological. He has a whole different point in telling the story. Mark's is like crisp, really, really clean. And um, so that's the reason I'm sharing that with you. So I want to I show you what I mean by context. The story starts off when Jesus is leaving Jerusalem. And the Bible says that as Jesus started on his way, as he started on his way, a man ran up to him, fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked. What must I do to inherit eternal life? 
If you've read this story before, I want everybody just to kind of hold your hand up and make a circle that's about the size of the eye of a needle. Just hold your hand up about that. And I, I know this could be true because what happens is Jesus answers the question, you know, honor your father and mother, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie. You know all these things. And the guy says, I've kept everything since I was a little child. And Jesus said, there's one thing that you lack. Go sell everything you have, give it to the poor, then come follow me and you can enter the kingdom. And the Bible tells us that that man went away sad and didn't make the 80 mile journey. Context, context, context. He's pulling no punches on this trip. He knows this is the last time he's going to see the Sea of Galilee from his own physical eyes. He knows this is the last time he's going to walk the sand where he felt fed the 5,000 or the grass, the green grass to be specific. He knows this is the last time he's going to Jerusalem. Somebody comes up and says, what do I need to do to enter the kingdom? He knows he's going to the Passover. He knows he's going to the cross. And he says, if you want to follow me, do as I do. What does that mean? The man who was God from the beginning of time, who had billions upon billions of angels worshiping him, who had creatures, living creatures praising him, who had everything perfect, gave up every bit of that to come down and serve. You think he's going to say, collect as much as you can on this planet? You think he's going to say, get rich and what? No, no, no. He's, he's going to speak. There's a lot of people who say, yeah, he wasn't talking about a real eye of the needle. You got to understand, like in Israel, and I know this is true. It could be true. It may not be true. There's a lot of things people add to the Bible that we don't know completely. But let me just give you this. Some people say this. They say, yeah, like at, at Israel, like in the, in the wall, there's like a, there's a hole in the wall. It's called the eye of the needle. And it's not real big. It's like a hole at the top and it's like thin at the bottom, kind of like the eye of a needle. And camels, when they went into the temple, they couldn't get through that unless they took off all of the baggage. I'm like, well, if that's what he meant, let's just start there. Let's just talk about simplifying all of the excess in our life for the kingdom of God. Either way, his disciples took him literally because they said this, this is an impossible teaching. Who can be saved? And Jesus said this, with man, it's impossible. Save us now. Save us now. It's impossible to be saved. Hosanna. Save us now. It's impossible be, to be saved. But with God, all things are possible. All right? So here he is in point number one. Hmm. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Put me first. Then he starts walking on, down the road to Jerusalem. And you get a lot. You go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, a lot happened on this trip. I'm just sticking to Mark, except for one place. I'm going I'm to go to Luke one time. Going on down the road in verse 32, it says, they were on their way up to Jerusalem. Why do they say up if they're going south? Because they're going up a mountain. Jesus was leading the way, and the disciples were astonished, while those who followed were afraid. Do you see that? This is not a happy, happy, joy, joy, Passover trip. The people on this trip are what? Astonished, shocked, and afraid that he's going to what he says is a cross. And they're hoping he modifies his own workout. They're hoping he changes his mind, especially Judas. Especially Peter. Peter's carrying a sword. You know they're carrying a sword. He cut a brother's ear off. Come on, pull. I can't even pull it out. I'm so weak, man. What? It's a Maasai sword. <clears throat> carrying a sword. Why are you saying that? Because they don't think they're going to a cross. You mean he didn't pull out a little, little come on, he was crocodile dundee. That's not a knife. This is a knife. He took the guy's ear off. He wasn't aiming for his ear. Oh, slice your ear off, a filet menier. <laughs> going for his head. He's like, cross? Ain't going to no cross. Astonished and shocked. 
he took the 12 aside and told them what was going to happen to him. He said, we're going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They're going to condemn him to death. They're going to hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he'll rise. Then they enter, it's, I'm not going to tell you this part. I'm not going to put the verse on the screen, I'll just tell it to you. Then they enter into Samaria. You can see this in another one of the Gospels. They enter an area called Samaria, which is like a place where there's half Jews and half Gentiles intermarried. And they wouldn't let him pass through Samaria because they were going to Jerusalem. That's how big the racism was in the first century. You can't even come through our town if you're going to Jerusalem, said the Samaritans. Can't come through our town. Not with all those Jewish people going up to the feast. A lot of people. They've got their whole guard, like nobody in town. Jesus' disciples are like, you want us to call down fire from heaven? You want us to strike them down? He said, no, we're going to go the long way around. They went around Judea on the other side of the Jordan. They crossed over the Jordan River, went right down the other side of the Jordan, where Armand Jordan is right now, and they came on down. No modification on this trip. Mark chapter 10, verse 35 says, <laughs> oh my goodness. The audacity. I call them sons of thunder. and I, I didn't bring a donkey, but I did bring the jawbone of a donkey today. Why? Because these people know their Bible. They know that if he's really the Messiah, then this is PG compared to what's happening. You're like, what's up with the jawbone of a donkey? There was a man named Samson who killed a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. And they're like, if Samson did that, what's Jesus going to do? What's he going to kill Rome with? What's he going to change the world with? Save us now! Save us now! What's he going to save us with? What's going to be his sword? What's going to be his weapon of choice? What's he going to do? Astonished and afraid, shocked on this trip. But how many of y'all understand the audacity of, uh, audacity of a soccer mom? Have y'all ever been to, to soccer practice with a mom who knows her kid is not playing enough? Anybody, anybody? How many of y'all are that mom? You're like, I don't know them. That's probably you then. <laughs> I'm talking about the person that's at the coach's ear all the time. Like, my baby's not playing enough. And you're afraid of what their future is going to be if they don't get one more rep, you know? The Bible says the next thing that happened on this 80-mile March is <laughs> James and John, the sons of Zebedee, verse 35. Come on. <laughs> they came to him <laughs> like, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Like somebody asked me that last week. They're like, hey, listen, man, listen, Sunday, next Wednesday night, I'm going to bring you something and you got you to gotta promise me you're going to wear it. I'm like, uh-uh. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I was born, but not last night. Are y'all with me? I was like, there's no way. Like, I, I don't make, I, I'm not promising to do something. I don't even know what you're going to ask. I was like, what was it? He goes, I want you to wear an Alabama Crimson Tide shirt. I will. I'll wear it like, uh, never mind. I'll, <laughs> I'll wear it in a way you don't want me to wear it. Jesus got hit with that. Hey, we want you to do whatever we ask. On this trip? Did you hear? I'm going to the cross. There's no favors here. There's no modified workout here. I'm, but man, it gets worse. If you look at Matthew chapter 20, they didn't do it on their own. Soccer mom brought them. The mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her boys. You know they left the fishing business to come and follow you. Our family is just not making money like we used to make. Their father is very depressed, and things are very hard right now. We're following you, but I got a favor I want you to ask. Boys, get down on your knees. Show him you're humble. <laughs> Jesus, we want to be dream team leaders with a name badge. We want to be in charge of the ushers. We want to be a deacon. We want to be pastors. We want to be preachers. We want a title. This melts me, man. It melts me. Man, I have a, such a hard time with this, y'all, because like I've, if you've been following on, on, on every morning on the Facebook page, like I, I love teaching the word, but I'm just getting rocked, y'all, at what's happened to the American church. Like it's really bad. It's really bad. I mean, like, 
in this sermon, the first thing people said in the lobby is, hey, last week was great, but this week, man, I couldn't, my, the, drum, the drums were a little bit, oh, this, this. today, did you hear the message? Did you hear the word? Today? Y'all can talk to me Wednesday. <laughs> I, I know, I know. Do you, do you, what do you want? You want, you want some like Bose earmuffs? Do you want your own sound? Do you want your tailor-made sermon that you can watch on your phone 12 inches in front of your screen? How comfortable do you want Christianity? How easy do you want it? What else do you want? You want like a, y'all join your church if you let me be in church. Really? The 80 mile context, there's no modification. Like get in line and pick up your cross. I need a job, Pastor Jeff. I want to work for the church. Did, 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 did you hear the sermon today? Following Jesus. It's not like a fanfare celebrity thing where you get, like, I know pastors who have like, I mean, I know, I know. I've served. I was the executive senior pastor of a of 15,000 member church. I was paid a really big salary. And like, I, I, I saw, I saw people get $100,000 honorariums. I saw it. I saw people come in and they wouldn't come unless we paid them $125,000. And I saw I saw senior pastors the order to write the checks for their friends, knowing that if they preach in their church, they're going to get the same treatment. I've seen this. I've seen people leave the church because it's, it's a show. I'm like, no smoke. Like, no smoke. No, chill, chill out the lights. Let's just, let's just worship, you know. Strip it back as much as we can. I mean, I remember one day, I was like, I know we paid a lot for that LED screen. That's just because y'all are blind. You know what I'm saying? Like, we're trying to, <laughs> won't you be able to see? <laughs> and they're like, do you want us to take it down? I was like, yeah, but no. Like, I, I can't tell you how bad I just want Jesus. Context. Watch this. Here's the first church split. Are you ready? When the 10 disciples heard those two dudes ask for a name badge, they snorted. They were so mad. That word indignant means to snort violently. Come on, I'm not going to tell you to do that. You might hawk up a lung. But these brothers started snorting. Like, how dare you little brats ask him like that and bring your mama up there and ask to play Come on, short stop. Jesus pulled him aside and he says, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great, you want a title, be quiet. I'm going into town on a donkey. Save us now. I will on a cross. Make us prosperous and successful. I will. Will. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. That's him. That's Jesus. And if you've experienced something else in church, I'm sorry. Every one of you who are new here are here in transition. All of you are. And you're probably going to get hurt here. I mean, the hardest part of every day is people. Are you with me? Does everybody understand that? I mean, everybody, raise your hand if your day is great until you see somebody. Just raise your hand. How many of y'all like love church, but like you love Jesus, but the church is a little bit difficult? Like it's like, yeah, is there any way we can like come on do this without being around people? People? Like, I want to serve, but I like does this mean like really serve? And not want a title at all? Yeah. I really struggle with being called Pastor Jeff. I I, I struggle with it. I I really do. Like, I'm, I, I, I'm going to, like, change the title of my webpage that says senior lead pastor or whatever. I'm like, he, there's one lead pastor. There's one. He's, it's him. 
And if he were standing right beside me, man, I wouldn't even want you to call me pastor. I don't even know if I'd qualify as servant. Do you understand who we're following on this road? Mm. For even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve. Here it goes again. The 80 mile context, I'm going to give my life as a ransom to save you out of your sin. I'm going to buy you out. Then you get to Mark chapter 10, and I'm not going like, to put the verses up on this one, but man, they get, to, they get to a little town called Jericho. And they get to Jericho, and there's a guy named Blind Bartimaeus. I mean, he don't even have a, like a, he don't get a real name. Like, what would they call you if you actually had, got called by what Jesus saved you from? <laughs> I don't even want you to put that word in front of my name. <laughs> Blind Bartimaeus. What would they put in front of your name? If you were described by what you were saved from. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Ah, when you see that phrase in scripture, listen to me carefully. Son of David, when you see that phrase in scripture, it's referring to a militant, like military, like the successor of King David who led great exploits. We want a Messiah who... Carries a sword, swings the jaw of a donk, a, a donkey, jawbone of a donkey. Gets us saved from Rome, make us successful. Jesus, Son of David, how do you know? Because one time people called him Son of David, and he's like, "Why do you call me Son of David? Didn't you actually see where Je- David actually says to my Lord, sit? His Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Why would David, if he was a son of David, call the Messiah Lord?" Jesus is like, the Messiah is more than a son of David. And listen to me carefully. This is deep, but I only do it for 30 seconds. Listen to me. The genealogy of Jesus through the line of David goes straight to Joseph, who was not Jesus' blood biological father, the son of God. Jesus, son of God, have mercy on me, is the more adequate answer. Jesus called him over. His disciples are like, shut up, man. We ain't doing no healing on this trip. We're going to Jerusalem. He's like doing something. I don't know what he's going to do, but he ain't time for healing. Get in line. Another thing happened, and this is actually in your Bible, but this is in Luke chapter 19. This is the part that's not in Mark. Luke chapter 19 starts off the journey to Jerusalem with a man named Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed him by, he looked up in that tree. Zacchaeus, you come down from there. Or all you good Bible school kids just got 100 plus on that test. I'm going to your house today. I'm going to your house today. Of all people to eat with on this trip, you're eating with the classification of people who are worse than sinners? He did. Filthy three. Number one is the 80-mile context. The second part is the 80-mile crowd. The 80-mile crowd. There's no way I can possibly, like, hit every element of this just because of time. But I want to show you what the 80-mile crowd is. I want you to look at these passages. I want you you to write them down. I'll tell you the narrative of it, and we'll land the plane for the day. The 80-mile crowd built and built and built and built and built and built. And built. And no one followed him thinking they were going to watch him die. But he told them, the disciples. Everybody else is like, oh, save us now. Hosanna in the highest. Save us now. I mean, he's got a hip hop artist in there. Like, I mean, they just tear. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Save us. What about this? Get your sword. You got your sword. You got your jawbone of a donkey. You got your. You got your weapons. I got my weapons. What you carrying? We carry. I got me a. The crowd. We know part of the crowd. If you actually follow this in Matthew chapter 19, Matthew 19 tells us that a large crowd from Galilee followed him to Jerusalem tells us in Mark chapter 10 verse 1 that a large crowd was present when he was healing and doing ministry in Judea. The Bible tells us that a large crowd in Jericho joined him. Huge crowd. Massive crowd. 
He had 20,000 people he fed in one day. They're all thinking, if we got all of our swords, I know we can take on the Jerusalem army, and then we can pull in all of Israel and show everybody that it's championship time. Then you get to the massive crowd at Bethany and Jerusalem. Oh, my goodness. You read John chapter 12. It's not going to be on the screen, but i got to give this to you. In John chapter 12, this is the place that you know in your Bible where Jesus raised a man from the dead. I'm not talking about 30 minutes on a ventilator in the hospital at the end of a car wreck and then comes back to life. I'm not talking about brain dead for 30 minutes. I'm talking about mummified, wrapped up in clothing and stuffed in a tomb, buried for four days, unconscious dead. That's Zach, um, um, uh, Lazarus. I'm going to call him Zacchaeus. Lazarus. And the Bible says in John chapter 12, verse 12, the next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, and they took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, save us now, save us now, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, blessed is the king of Israel, the king of Israel, the king of Israel, so many people, there's no way Pilate's coming to town at the same time, a much bigger crowd. Pilate's coming to town, Jesus is coming to town. I, I wish I could go off on that. That's a very important fact. But Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as, as is written in Zechariah 9, uh, uh, 9, verse 9. Then it says this, um, down in verse 17. Now the crowd, watch this, the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb, and raised him from the dead, continued to spread the word. What would you do if a friend or anyone in your city that you knew had already had their funeral, had already been buried six feet under the ground, and dirt is rolled over them, and he's raised from the dead by the voice of Jesus, would you tell anybody about that? The whole crowd, a massive crowd, in Jerusalem is like, he's coming to town. He's coming to town. Save us now. We know you're going to be the king. We know you're going to lead us. We know you're going to conquer Jerusalem. and You're going to conquer Rome. We know you are. Save us now. Hosanna to God in the highest. You're God. You're king. You're everything. Save us now. Huge crowd. You're like, how do you know it was a big crowd? Because it says this, many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. The crowd was so big, the Pharisees called the crowd the whole world. Oh. What they're yelling when they say, save us now, is Psalm 118, 25 through 26. In the King James Version, the New King James Version, it doesn't say Hosanna. It doesn't say, Lord, save us. It says, save us now. Save us now. Lord, save us. Which means, Lord, give us success. Man, I'm telling you straight up, I know this. I've seen it happen. I've been a part of the, the most successful mega churches in the world. I've been there. I used to talk like a mega church pastor. I used, I used to. I used to talk about how big we're going to be one day. I've repented. All my leaders know I have. I don't have any desire to build a big church. I have a desire to activate you, to encourage you, to love you where you are, and watch you change your world. I have a desire to see over 200 churches planted right up here in North Texas, and I could care less if any of them had the name Anchor on them. I don't care. God's humbling us. He's humbled us. We want to know Jesus. Oh, man. The fastest way to grow a church in, in Te McKinney, Texas, is to convince people that you can actually provide them security and give them success. Nothing's changed. Nothing's changed from the crowd. Oh, safe, not going to get hurt, successful, blessed and highly favored. Kids going to obey Jesus. Kids are going to get off drugs. Kids, gonna, success, you want success. What if they don't? What if they don't? What if nothing changes? What if nothing changes in, until it gets harder? Save us now. Save us now. Give us success. Bless is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Point number one is the 80-mile context. Point number two is the 80-mile crowd. Point number three is the battle cry. 
the battle cry. Oh, my goodness. I did, I, I, I've said this a lot of times, and I say it, you know, I mean, don't be impressed, but I, I say it a lot. But I, I remember a lot of times in college when we would, we would go to different stadiums. And I remember specifically the, the very first turn, time that I went to the University of Alabama, go Tigers. And um, I was a backup center for LSU, Louisiana State University. And, um, and I, was, I remember the, the night we arrived in town and we're all on a bus. And all those nights when you arrive in town, all of the players want to go walk in the stadium. We all want to. And the people put on their cleats and they want to walk the grass and find the soft spots and find where everything's at. And they want to modify the size of their cleats if it's a little bit soggy or whatever, you know. And they want to get their high knees up there and walk the field, all their traditions and that's like the pre, that's the pre-night, that's the night before. And I think about this when I see the battle cry, is when Jesus actually arrived, and you read this verse right here, it's like the night before the game. Jesus entered Jerusalem, went into the temple courts, he looked around at everything, partly because he's assessing what he's going to turn over in just a few days, partly because He's assessing what he's going to turn over in you today. As God makes you the temple the Holy Spirit dwells in, what tables are going to get turned over this week in you? What religion has to fall today in you? You're like, why do you call it the battle cry? Well, if you picture this, like I literally come on, I'm a, I'm a very good artist. Like I put, I transpose those crosses on top of that. Like I did that. Don't be impressed. Like, it's not that impressive, but I did that because I think perhaps that when he saw Jerusalem, he knew what save us now means. He knew what he was going to have to do to save, and it wasn't going to be with a sword. It was going to be with a cross. He knew it wasn't going to be withdrawing somebody else's blood. It was going to be with giving up all of his it wasn't going to happen with breaking somebody else's skull open with the jawbone of a donkey. It was going to happen with his own beard being plucked out, his own face being marred and disfigured, his own back being mutilated to the point that his internal organs were exposed. He knew what save us now meant, and he went silently, showed up on a donkey <laughs> for you. You're like, why are you crying? Because I know the slide that's coming up. I know what's next. I've preached this before. Look at the next slide. It ain't Sunday yet, y'all. This is the same night. The Bible says, as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept. He wept. Why did he cry? Oh, this is just going to hit you right in the nose. I know it is, and I'm sorry, but no, I'm not sorry, okay? He wept and said, if you... Even you had known this day what would bring you peace. It's not the president that you want to vote for. It's not the peace in the Middle East or getting the, in charge of the oil. It's not getting in control of the whole economy and getting your, pay, your, your paycheck higher and getting your 401k. Come on, how many of y'all's 401k has gone down to about a 102L? Like, it's not, it's, not, it's not that. This is the big, big deal. If you knew what was going to give you peace... If you knew what was going to save you, if you knew what was going to save your marriage, it's not being right. It's not being in charge. It's not being the voice that matters. It's not. If you knew what was going to save you, if you knew, if you knew it was the cross, like if you knew, if you only knew, and the whole time he's going, you can't know because this has to happen. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes right there where you are. Save us now. Save us now. Right here in this new building, Lord, we give it to you. It's you. Don't, don't, don't judge how pretty things are. It's, it's, Jesus never had an auditorium like this. Jesus never had lights, the sound, the band. He had nothing. I mean, like he, he, had, he had all that and he gave up all that. Like we, we're very privileged in a way. At the same time, it hurts us a little bit to have things so comfortable. Just say it under your breath right now. Save me now. Save me from my own desires, my own flesh, my own ego, my own ambition, my own selfishness. Just whisper it to him. Just say, Lord, save me now. 
And if you're in a place right now where you know that you know that you know that you've never surrendered to Jesus and you probably would have left like the rich man did and not followed him, but you sense something different today, then right now, I want you to give your heart to Jesus. I want you to say, Jesus, you can have my life. I give you my life. And if that's you, on the count of three, I want you to boldly raise your hand. Like, I want you to do that. Nobody's looking around. And I've heard preachers go, every eye up, every head up. I want to see it. Being no, 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 no. It's a sacred moment right now. There'll be a time for you to take the stand later. This is between you and the Lord right now. And I just want to ask you my, right now, if that's you, you want to give your heart to Jesus. On the count of three, just slip your hand up. Don't be embarrassed. One, two, three. Just slip your hand up. Don't be embarrassed. My hand's all over. I see your hand. Don't be embarrassed. Don't be embarrassed. Right now, in the presence of God, the Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that if you, if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, if you confess with your mouth he is Lord, you will be saved. It's like the Virgin Mary. The way she conceived was not an angel just came upon her. The Bible says that she said the words, be it unto me according to your word, according to your promises. Jesus, come in. Save me. So I want you to say this prayer. It's not a prayer in the Bible. It's not like a cantation. The words are not what save you. It's your heart. It's the Lord Jesus. He knows if you're serious. Just say this, Jesus, out loud. Everybody just say it with them. Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on a Roman cross for me. I believe you were buried and raised from the dead. Today, I believe you are God. I believe you're Lord. You are Savior. And by your grace, I give you my heart. Forgive me of my sin. From this day forward, I follow you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Change my life. Lead me in my next steps. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, give God a shout of praise. Oh, come on, give him a shout of praise.